Udacast, informing your decisions with intelligence, analysis, and insight. Brought to you by the team at OodaLoop.com. Hello, I'm Bob Gourley, and welcome to the Udacast. Today on the Udacast, Renee Wynn. Renee, thanks for joining us. Bob, it's fabulous to be here on your Udacast. I had to practice saying that because I was going to say the Uda podcast, which would not be right up your marketing strategy <laughs> there. It's great to be here. And you know, I'm the former chief information officer for NASA, and I retired from the federal government a few years ago after 30 years of service. It's great to see you again um, and reconnect after a few years uh, break because of the pandemic. Yeah, yeah, that was a horrible long break, and it is good to reconnect. Although uh, it's good being digitally connected, so I can track you from afar. Um, I know we're going to enjoy this conversation today. Looking forward to it. You know, so Renee, can you start with a bit of your career arc? Because um, it's seems like it's been a very interesting journey for you. I have, Bob, I have had a really interesting journey. And, and a lot of times when I give speeches, especially with women, I always like to set the stage with this first and foremost. I graduated from a liberal arts college. There's still a need for us graduates. I had a Bachelor of Arts in Economics and my final position of record in the United States government was the CIO of an iconic agency, highly science and technology related, and that is at NASA. And so I like to tell people that your career arc is, it's a journey and it will take pivots and you might not like the pivots and it'll take pivots that you're panic over, which I did, I'll tell you about in a second. And all of it is really about preparedness and really should focus on capabilities and not a job title. If I had focused on a job title when I was in college, uh, I wouldn't have been a CIO because that job didn't even exist yeah. when I was in college. So if you focus on capabilities, you never know where your journey will take you. So when I graduated from college, it was uh, back in the mid 80s. So now everybody can do the calculator uh, and figure out how old I am. That's not hard. Uh, and and what I did when I came out, it was during one of the recessions. And so finding a job was really hard, especially for a liberal arts uh, college graduate. I think if I'd had an engineering degree, it would have been a lot easier or a computer science degree. So I ultimately landed a job at a student loan marketing association where I learned programming and I learned programming of SAS, which is still very much around because I was impatient I needed some data. I was in the business side, so I wanted some data from our computer system. And I got put in a queue with our programmers. And I went, what do you mean I didn't get number one at the programming queue like you do at the bakery? And so I asked my boss, I said, well, can I go, can I go learn for myself? Because I'll just do simple things, right? It's just being better at your job by being more self-sufficient and pulling on resources when it really is beyond your capability and augmentation of your capability. Boss was agreeable for that. And so I went to a SAS class and taught myself SAS. And so then I just did some side programming. And because of that, uh, I dropped my friend of mine had put my resume in at Booz Allen and I was picked up by Booz Allen to be a SAS programmer, which I ended up never being. I was customer focused. I was the person in front of the customer interviewing the customer about what data they needed from the program, which made it great because understanding SAS made it easier for me to ask good questions with the client so that the really good programmers, which I wasn't a very good programmer, remember I said impatience, yeah. and to program, it's learning a new language. It's hard to immerse because no one speaks SAS out in the wild. When you go to France, you're not speaking SAS, you're speaking French. Yeah. So um, that's how I got introduced to EPA from Booz Allen. And that's how really my computer vision and how computers can augment and make your life better got started as well. And so I fell in love with EPA's mission. Well, Who doesn't want clean air, clean water, right? Renee, mm -hmm. I want to talk more about uh, EPA and that part of your journey, but it also, we've been doing a little research on our OODA Loop website, and me, I've been a, a technologist my whole life, 
But my big gap was that liberal arts kind of background. So I, I try to study that and learn more and find some of it's very enjoyable. We just published a post that um, I've been researching for quite a while where I talk about the great philosophers, um, Plato and those folks, and the lessons they have for cybersecurity, this very technical domain and technical field. And it's one of those posts that underscores the fact that yeah, we need the liberal arts in this domain of cybersecurity and technology overall. So I thought I should slow down and ask you, what was your liberal arts uh, studies? What did it give you? What did it give me? Um, one, it taught me to write, which is a skill that is so critical, even in the era of text messages and emojis. It taught you to think, and it also taught you to organize your arguments. Mm. And so economics, you know, there are so many economists alive and dead. And all you needed to do was pick a theory that you wanted to defend. And there was a whole slew of economic papers that could support what you wanted to do. So with my economics degree, half of it's finance. So understanding business, and it's just an understanding and appreciation helped in public service because the money my programs were provided are tax dollars, and we needed to defend them in front of Congress. And so you had to be able to understand the numbers to tell the story. And then the second part is you need to be able to defend your arguments and policy. So you always looked for different places that might have done a policy decision the same way you had. And I think to your point and to cybersecurity, and I think this is true of anything, different thought processes help things to be better. There's a story, an older story about a woman with autism who was brought in by the cattle industry, a particular business in that, to help have a, a good process for cows when moving them. Because when one cow gets unsettled, the whole herd gets unsettled. So keeping the cow, the cows calm when moving them it keeps them safe and it keeps the people close to them safe. Well, that's a different view. It's different thinking. And so different thinking, I, I'm a big believer in it always makes things better. Cool. Well, um, thanks. And that all resonates. And I tell you, um, it underscores a lesson for, I think, all of us. Um, no matter what your background is, keep learning. Isn't that the truth? Absolutely. Um, I mean, right now, a, a, we were talking a little before this program, right, and about AI. And so NASA has put AI on Mars in 2003 because uh, of the rovers. The distance between Earth and Mars is quite large. And so we're not sending, yes, we are sending commands, up to the rovers, but the rovers are autonomous as well because of the AI. Well, now you and I have AI at our fingertips and I'm not some mathematical genius or anything. You may be, I'm not gonna speak for you, Bob. <laughs> and this way I can augment my work. I can be better through AI as long as I understand the risks as well as I understand the opportunities. Where is it best to use AI to augment what I'm doing? And where is it best left to, nope, let this just come from the Renee brain and the product will be just fine. So being curious about something I think is precisely what NASA is all about, but I think that's what makes us better as people, as well as, as professionals in our service to others. Right, thanks. Well, back to your career arc. So EPA <clears throat> um, and who doesn't want clean water and clean air? You said it. I think what a great mission. And that whole place must be focused on the mission. But... It, it absolutely is focused on the mission at EPA. And so is NASA. And I'll tell you in just a second, a story about the differences from my little knot hole. And when I got exposed to that mission, it sparked in me something 
that was working for my heart, like going to work, even when you're exhausted and going, I'm so excited to go because who doesn't want to serve others for greater good, be part of something much bigger than yourself. And EPA was my first exposure to something of that nature. My parents were federal employees, but my mom was a spy. So there's not much that I knew about her job. My dad worked at NASA and honestly, he was a metallurgist. Like what's that? Which I came to learn when I went to NASA. So don't hit you up on the comments, please. I learned to respect metallurgists in that. But the fact that I could be part of something ensuring that communities have access to clean air, clean water, safe chemicals, and appropriate use of land, which is I worked in the land programs. I, I was like, this is a no brainer. How do I sign up? And, and I was fortunate enough to then transition from the private sector into EPA, where I worked at EPA for about 25 years, and then I switched to NASA. Right. Okay. Well, um, let's, let me ask first, before we go to NASA, what was your role at, as a CIO? How does a CIO contribute to the mission at EPA? Yeah, so I'm going to go back. So I worked in mission for about 16 years on the land-based programs, a super fund program, which most folks know about. And I worked on the super fund sites considered national priorities, you know, to clean up that were owned and operated by the United States government, specifically Department of Defense and Department of Energy. And I got an amazing opportunity to bring my economics to work working on the base closure programs all five rounds. So that was really cool. And in that, computers were coming to our desk. And honestly, you saw people, the little CD-ROM holders, when we got those, when we moved from the five and a quarter floppies to the three and a half hard, hard disks that they were, and then we went to the CD form. You would go by some people's desk and they had their coffee cup or their drink sitting in their CD-ROM holder. And you're going, oh my <laughs> gosh, if that spills, that computer is not going to work anymore. I'm just giving you a sense of what it was like computers walking into the door and getting rid of the little pieces of message paper and all of that. My first email. And it was really fun to be part of that. Well, as that came in, it sparked in me this enablement of IT and reporting and telling better stories to Congress and the public about the benefits of the money that was spent in Superfund. And it certainly made a big difference in so many communities uh, out there. So that was how I saw this convergence of technology and mission delivery. Well, Bob, I will confess that if I don't like something, I will tell people about that. <laughs> and uh, at about that time, I was meeting with uh, the newly minted uh, CIO and assistant administrator for the Office of Environmental Information, Malcolm Jackson, who was ultimately became my boss. And he invited me, you know, through an official process to become his deputy. So I was I was an acting CIO of NASA, of, of EPA, but I was never the actual CIO. I was the deputy CIO and, and under his tutelage, I learned a ton and I brought to him that mission perspective because he was a technology person. And our service to the mission were many things. Now, some people would probably argue that we were not in service to the mission because Nobody really likes the CIO and CISO community yeah. as much, but they're grateful for us some days, which I always take those some days. But in particular, one thing is the environmental data quality program for all of EPA was in our organization. The basis of excellent decisions begins with quality data. So the integrity of the data, the mm -hmm. process you followed to collect it. So you're collecting it in some really precarious situations at EPA. Um, and then you have data storage and that's where cybersecurity comes in and making sure that the integrity of the data stays intact. And so um, we were in service to the mission, not only by providing services, IT services, compute, data center and all of that, but we ran the data quality program and we also ran the, at the time, the toxic release inventory where we shared with the world, but largely the U.S., uh, the um, toxic releases 
that we're required to report you know, by regulation. And we put that report out. So that program was us. So we served directly to the mission by supporting and enabling them. And then secondly, we delivered programs that were foundational to reporting to the public, as well as foundational to really good decisions in um, challenging situations such as environment. So, well, thank you. Thanks for that. And thanks for your service. Because, I mean, really, all of us uh, benefit from your work there. And we appreciate it. Well, thank you. It was great fun most days. Most days. I, yeah. did, I didn't like when squirrels took out the power. And, yeah. I, and that happened... That happened at NASA, at EPA, we had the um, uninterruptible power supply, the UPS, disrupted twice. But I did ask the team, stop calling it UPS because you're telling me this story twice. <laughs> and it was a backhoe. So IT doesn't like backhoes and squirrels. Yeah. Well, from there, you went to NASA. Mm -hmm. And before getting into that, I wanted to say, um, I think NASA may be the most famous agency in all of government because uh, everybody's so proud of it and they love the mission um, and they see the results of the mission. So, uh, but what people don't see, and maybe this is just my opinion, is it looks like a complex organization to me with um, multiple components, multiple regional facilities. Can you help us understand the NASA organization? Yeah, so we'll begin with the culture. I promised I would do this. At EPA, the people love the environment, love it. Tree huggers, beautiful language, right? I was, and I am one of them, right? Every year I try to make an advancement in, in improving, reducing my environmental footprint. Plastic bottles, less electricity, take uh, less gas, like by biking to the grocery store and things like that. So that's a personal thing at NASA. People love NASA. So, so you dive into this culture where it's very, it's different. One is very different. However, I do remind people that I saw what we were doing to the mother earth. NASA at the time was really the big holders of rockets. So I was excited to move there just in case we needed to find earth 2.0. <laughs> so when I shifted over to NASA, I found, wow, people love NASA, like years, decades of service to NASA, including the contracting community that worked there. There's about 17,000 employees, civil servants at NASA, but there were about 65,000 people on our network every day, and they were not all doing good things on it, I know, because I was the CIO there. So when I got to NASA, it was... My first question was, what did I just do to myself? Because you are absolutely right. It is big and it is complex. Here on terra firma, there are 10 centers, in, and I include in that Jet Propulsion Lab, JPL, which is at Caltech, which is the federal facility, um, FFRDC, uh, Research and Development Corporation, something like that. I Yeah, FFRDC, yep. Yeah. Federal Facility Research and Development Corporation. And they did a lot of really cool work for NASA. In fact, the um, Mars rovers were done there. And that, so now you think about our expanse is coast to coast. Our space outposts are uh, ones in Australia. There's one in the Pacific and one in Spain. And so now our data comes down from space all over the globe. So now NASA's footprint is global. And by the way, we operate in space. So our NASA's footprint is global and off the globe. And the IT services provided by the CIO are global and off the globe. The CIO does work with the International Space Station and provides services to them. And so that was an eye-opening moment. I'm like, oh, that is great that we're doing that. We have that partnership. And that's when your cyber brain starts to kick and go, hmm, what do our cyber mm. risks look like? Because what worried me the most when I was at NASA was if we had an incident, a cyber incident on an international space station, it was an international incident. So like State Department and Defar Department of Defense and other agencies, you sort of face this international, uh-oh, please not on my watch. 
So now that I've laid the groundwork, we're across the globe, we're off the globe, data are coming from all of these sources for the benefit of humankind and the advancement of science and technology and the arts and design. And so that's how complex it is. And in many ways, I just, I was proud of being part of that, but I couldn't let that vastness be a worry. It just needed to be something you took into consideration. There was never going to be a simple answer to anything other than choosing my shoes before I went to work. There was always a simple answer with that one. A, the two, the left and right needed to match because we all got <laughs> dressed in the dark in the winter. And the second part is they need to be reasonably close to the outfit I was wearing. And then after that, the simple decisions were over for the day. So um, it's just hard to explain to people. And cybersecurity threats are in space. Um, Mission Control Center for Human Exploration, it's a single operator to space station. Uh, the, the team there did a, does a magnificent job of, of securing that. On the science side, I think of them as apartment building. I'm just giving a sense of the complexity from a cyber and IT perspective. So I think of the Mission Control Centers for Science as apartment buildings. One person makes curry, which I love. Everybody around that apartment building knows that curry is being made or onions are being sauteed or garlic's being sauteed, right? Everyone knows about it. And I give that image because that's what the cyber threats are like in a science mission because it's in this apartment building for a mission con control center. Lots of different scientists are accessing it and making great things happen. So from top out into the universe in the vast amount of space down to mission control centers, NASA is complex and frankly, very cool. Yeah. And um, also the way you describe that underscores that you also have this massive supply chain of partners that includes probably every academic institution in the world wants to work with you. Uh, then every contractor in the world wants to provide capabilities to you. So it, it becomes an extremely complex in enterprise. It does. It does. And there's many a GAO and an IG report that you can read about that complexity. You know, Bob, bringing up supply chain risk, I, I love that we're going there with this conversation. There's the known part of supply chain risk I think everybody naturally gets, integrity of the parts. Not only do the parts need to have the highest integrity at NASA, they need to have space integrity, right? Which is yeah. very, very harsh. It looks really dreamy out there with the cool photo, the images that come back from James Webb Space Telescope, but that's hard stuff and it's hard to get there. Um, so we get that in the fact that you could get these things, which is another, can be another challenge. There's this whole other newer angle of supply chain risk with hardware and software. And that is the cyber aspect of it. Who's making it? Who's funding it? <laughs> yeah. um, who are the coders? And, and getting to the answer of who's really the coder? and who's really providing it. When you look at chips and chip manufacturing, which NASA is a big consumer of chips, it becomes very interesting about the chips that you can buy, should buy. And if a mission's already uh, way in the late in the development stage and the chips may or be suspicious about adding on it, then my team had to learn what NASA did with chips. Uh, even those chips that were questionable so that the mission could still fly. So I got to, I got to learn a lot and I especially got to learn a lot about the supply chain from the integrity of the parts down to, you know, frankly, where are our coders located? And I think many companies learned that Ukraine um, had a lot of great coders provided great services to companies across the globe. And we learned pretty quickly about how, um, hard it is and tragic it is it's great to have a global footprint but there'll be these times when it's just heartbreaking to what happens so yeah, yeah supply chain risk is huge and it's so multifaceted that we forget that it encompasses everything cool well renee can i transition and start asking you a few questions about what you're up to today Sure. It's not so, as interesting as NASA, but I'm happy to well, share Well, I want to get back to NASA and our collective future for sure. But 
I know you're working with some great capabilities out there and I hear your name all the time. And I just wonder what you're doing and what you're innovating. Yeah. So I have now what's called a portfolio career, which was not my intent uh, when I decided to retire, but it's what I got and I love it. So one part of that portfolio portfolio is serving on a corporate board, which is the area I'd like to expand. And I work for, um, I'm on the board for Exonius, which is an asset and SaaS management platform so that clients can answer the critical question, what is on your network? And when NASA started its monitoring of our network, Uh, with the CDM program. Back when I started at NASA, we found 40,000 pieces of software on it, which was the first time NASA got to see its full footprint. And so seeing your footprint helps you know your risks and manage your risks. From there, I serve on advisory boards for some technical companies, especially those that go do their serve in service to the United States government because we have some different cybersecurity requirements. So I help them navigate that. I um, I am an independent consultant, uh, including for a mesh uh, experience, which is a marketing firm. It's because they're trying to build out a software as a service platform. And mm-hmm. I met the owner and she said, hey, could you come advise me on this one? And I'm learning a ton about marketing. Um, boy, I am the first one fooled by marketing campaigns. I'm like, I am all in. That's a great p- product. If it's going to make me younger and faster, I'll take it. Not with harm to my body, but I'm the first one to believe. So it's been fun to do that. And then I serve on some nonprofit boards. I serve on the MITRE Public Sector Advisory Board and Virginia Tech Applied Research Corporation, which is a, a great way to apply what I've done in the past to help them in their future. And it keeps me in touch with cutting edge technology and its practical application and where it will work best. So that's uh, really fun. And I'm also on a 501c, the Women's Center, which helps uh, women, families, and children. Uh, The biggest service that we provide through helping them is through mental health services on a sliding scale, which is a huge need. And we're happy to serve the local community here in the Washington, D.C. area. So and my final thing is I used to get in trouble and send to the principal's office for speaking up way too often. And now I even get paid for speaking, largely talk about leadership. I tell space stories and talk about being a female at an executive level running an amazing agency like NASA, as well as EPA. Yeah. So it's varied. No day is ever the same. Um, And my motto is I'm here to help others be successful because it is all of the people, including my family, and especially my family that supported me, that's put me in this position to give back in in a great way. Awesome. Well, thanks for that overview. It sounds very exciting. It is fun. Yeah, I'm learning a ton, too. Like sometimes they throw an acronym at me and I'm like, okay, I really don't know that acronym. (laughs) Um, And you think you know them all when you leave the government. It, it seems like that's a good way to keep learning because you've just reviewed such a diverse array of things you're involved with, and it must be a, a great source of interesting ideas. It is, and it goes back to meeting a bunch of diverse people, right? You know, you, you see, like in a board situation, advisory board in that, so I leave every meeting with this m- mesh of experience that enriches me. Yesterday, uh, the Virginia Tech, we had a an audit committee meeting and we were talking about cyber uh, and that. And, and I heard from our lawyer, his perspective on cybersecurity. And I heard from a, a longtime Virginia businessman, his perspective on cybersecurity and they were very different. And so then it blended in my mind my viewpoint, right, which was hair on fire uh, all the time, is is how do you blend their needs and how they learn and how they consume and understand information into a cybersecurity report that will be effective for a board? So it was really great. That's just even yesterday, and I, you know, was quickly taking notes. I felt like a quilter, just quickly taking a a blue piece of material and putting that next to the pink piece of material and making sure that it was lined up and and looked reasonable to the eye and, you know, quickly putting the next one in the next one. So yeah, you just sit at the table both to give 
and you definitely receive as long as you're open to it. Cool. Well, Renee, we would love to ask you some additional questions about the future, um, including especially the future of space and the space economy, but any other aspect of the future that you can give us insights into. And to start, let me tell you something else you reminded me of. Um, so a friend of mine and a, a coworker um, who's been in networking forever, Junaid Islam, has been helping uh, with uh, these groups of people that are helping NASA come up with communications protocols for space. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that is so interesting. And of course, there's a need for different protocols because um, you need to know when you're in uh, line of sight and there's going to be some object in between you and you got to understand your data rates and all these other complex things. Um, but he's not the first guy to think space protocols. Looking back through history, in 1960, there was this guy named uh, Linklider who um, worked at DARPA, or it was called ARPA at the time. And he was pulling together groups of people to talk about interoperable networks. So this is way before there was an internet program. And he called his meetings um, the intergalactic network meetings. So this guy's already thinking, we got to have an intergalactic network. Um, and I think maybe he was a sci-fi fan, or uh, maybe he was just a visionary and realized that one day we're going to have to have a network that spans the entire galaxy. Um, so with that, can you give us yeah. your views of the future of space? Yeah, so I'll begin with where you ended, Bob, and that is science fiction. I not a big reader of science fiction. My husband is, so that's great, right? You don't, if you know people that have these interests, you could just go tap their brain and use your time <laughs> and get to know them. Obviously, I know my husband, but, you know, get to know others with different in, in, interests that can bring to bear what you're doing or problems you're trying to solve. Sci-fi is the basis for so many things because when we read something or see it in a movie, it, it, um, imprint on our brain what's possible, right? And so I, uh, I've learned of what's called useful fiction, and, and I, I'm an advocate of using this in cybersecurity because so many people, because you can't see cybersecurity, if we could tell more sci-fi or useful fiction stories about cybersecurity, maybe, just maybe, we could really start to solve and make some huge leaps in securing our networks and securing our data a little bit differently. So it, it is when someone can dream big and, and be a visionary, there are so many people that are, that they set this vision that inspires others to follow along. And it doesn't mean a visionary, I don't think ever fails because in our quest to reach that vision, so much is discovered and invented along the way. And I'll give you an example of that. So a recent example, mining in space. People have had this vision for the longest mm. time. Yeah. Guess what? The proof point or the pathfinder has been done. People say, what? I said, yes. yes. Japan and the United States landed robots on asteroids. Asteroids travel at up to 17,000 miles per hour. So we positioned, both com co countries positioned such that you could put in a robot on a moving object from an orbiting object. Robot went down, took a sample, Grab that sample, return to the vehicle, and that vehicle returned to this planet we call Earth. Those samples are being studied now because they would be sort of the first of the samples that came back to Earth without burning up in the atmosphere. So there's so much to be learned from this. So now space mining, which has been talked about in sci-fi for years and years and years, we've now had the pathfinder for it. Yeah. And now more and more... Um, curious people with amazing backgrounds are going to come up with ways to make it cheaper to mine in space. Now we got to look at the harm that's caused by it, but see, that's the perfect example of how science fiction becomes fact on a regular basis at NASA and other places 
It inspires people, it challenges people. And on their way there, they will fail, but on their way there, they will succeed because the next generation will be inspired to pick up the baton and go from there. So yeah. that's something that was outlandish that's now becoming possible. Yeah. And I love that example. That's a great example. I like that a lot. Mm -hmm. You know, um, when I was a child, I got to see the moon landings and everybody saw it. And for me, as a young kid, maybe 10 or 11, that was amazing. For my parents, it was even more. It was just, they're doing the impossible. Um, but at that time and through most of my adult life, I thought of the moon as just a rock. I thought, and maybe all of us did. It's just this big rock. Well, through more research and studies, it turns out it's not just a big rock. It's It's got water. It's got ice. It's got minerals and ores and some rare earth elements that could be of use in space exploration. It's really not a rock. It's, um, a, a, it's a bunch of natural resources that can be used to get humanity further out in space. You are absolutely right. And and it is so exciting when we have those opportunities. And I think it'd be great to share with folks too that NASA has an organization called Planetary Protection. And as we delve into what space can do for us here on Earth, we need to ask ourselves, what are we doing to space and what would we potentially do to Earth and what is the tipping point, right? I, I see what we're doing with Earth from an environmental perspective. Uh, and there are things we really need to get better on uh, from our air pollution to our, you know, potable water and that. And so as we explore space and we imagine mining and going to the moon and benefiting from the resources of it, we need to ask ourselves the ethical ethical questions as well as planetary protection questions. Planetary protection, which wouldn't be planet to the moon. I'm not saying moon's planet. How do we protect the moon, right? So we don't end up hurting it beyond use, which thank you for the tides. Um, and how do we go back and forth from the moon and not uh, negatively impact our planet? So NASA I sat in on a number of conversations about planetary protection, including the sample return uh, missions that I just told you about from an asteroid is what does that mean when we do that? And they were fascinating conversations back to our first comment, which was diverse perspectives. I sat in that one like I was in a science class. You know, they, of course, would say, hey, Renee, any cyber concerns? I was like, well, the aliens bring thumb drives. Let's not plug them into our network was about the best I could think of at that point because it was just beyond my thinking in that. But it was great to sit into in on because it exposed me to thinking I wouldn't have thought of. So everything we do in space exploration is magnificent. It has benefits to humanity. And we need to look at the ethical issues. And we also must examine planetary protection from both angles both from here on terra firma as well as what happens in space. I think it's exciting. I think it goes back to why do we have philosophers? Why do we have liberal arts people still coming out? And that's because in ethical debates, you need all angles to put, you know, put up on the proverbial whiteboard so you can be thoughtful in your approach to risks, identifying those risks and risk mitigation. Fascinating. Yeah, uh, this makes a lot of sense. And I want to ask you another question. First, let me tell you, um, regarding liberal arts, um, Jeffrey Koons is a famous artist, and he uh, does a lot of um, very high-end art. He uh, produced a art project and sent it to space on this last, uh, this um, um the, the first return to the moon in 50 years, on 14 February, uh, there was a Falcon 9 launch that sent a probe to the moon. And on that was his art capsule. It's uh, 125 little art projects. And he's now um, um, generating media attention uh, to this. And with the uh, idea of inspiring others to do more in space, and I thought that's a very interesting mix of art and science, because I think there's so many people who are huge fans of space and are excited about things like Project Artemis, 
But there's a lot of others that have just kind of become numb to all of this stuff. And maybe this art project is a way of expanding the number of people that are excited about space again. Um, I got to see that launch uh, thanks oh. to a, a woman entrepreneur, Chantel Bayer, of a company called Forspace. Uh, she had a launch party and we went down to Florida and uh, got as close as you can to this Falcon 9. And it was just so exciting. Thinking back to my childhood again, I saw on TV, Walter Cronkite talking about the Saturn V's going to the moon. Now I'm there watching the first return to the moon of a U.S. Uh, rocket. Uh, so, so exciting. But anyway, I would love your thoughts about this um, mixture of art and science, if you have any. Yeah, well, that's exciting. You got to go down to a launch um, and, and probably sit in those bleachers, right? Yep. Looking across the right yep. the water and hopefully it was a clear day for you guys. And it was, it was, when you... it was 2 a.m. So it's pitch black outside. And then oh. all of a sudden it became daylight. It's just amazing. What a great time to see a launch. I know most people are like, hey, can I see it when I'm really awake? But seeing it at night is cool. I got to see a launch out of Kazakhstan at night. Um, it was worth getting getting up for and, and the long day that we had. But yeah, it's very cool to see it at night because you can really see how things light up in the sky. I love that you brought up the art and science convergence. And I'm going to take a look at that launch. I think that was the Intuitive Machines probe yes, that landed. That was it. Yeah. And right and on the side on... of Intuitive Machines, there's a little box you'll see the picture of. And that's where the art is. Very cool. I'll look for that one. And hopefully the other listeners will too. So the convergence of art and science. All right, let's begin with robotics. So the early robots that were put into uh, large inventory warehouses, when a human needed to, when, you know, they were working alongside of humans, but the first robots needed to learn and designers needed to learn how to have robots and humans safely interact, right? right? Get the robot to stop before hitting the human or hitting the side of something. And humans are hard because we're not, we're mo mobile objects. And that, so robots, we had a few accidents in the, you know, early warehouse robots because of the interaction with the humans and the robots themselves. And so that has advanced and that's art, right? That is, and working with a robot is 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 taking design concept concepts and art concepts and the physical movement of humans and those concepts and putting them together so that humans can interact with robots in a safe manner. There's um J Japan put a a little orb like is it BB from one of the Star Wars, right? You could there's some. Um, cool videos with that. Well, that orb had to interact with humans safely in space. And so that's an art and design with science and engineering and mathematics because it's robotics. But now I'm going to go to origami. Origami? You say origami? Well, yeah. James Webb Space Telescope, those three massive sun shields, the size of football fields. How does that get into a little old rocket? Now the rockets aren't that small, but when you consider a football size sun shield has to get into a rocket and then unfurl appropriately on launch in space. So let's just make yeah. this harder and harder. Yeah. Getting it into the rocket is inspired by origami. Really? Yeah. The art of folding paper in ways that is just so fascinating. And it was origami that helped solve for the folding and unfolding of the sun shields on our now famous James Webb Space Telescope. And so there's just so many examples of arts and design and science and technology coming together for so many different reasons. Yeah, so the origami and robotics. Fascinating. Well, Renee, any uh, other thoughts about the space economy and what's hot right now? What do you see as the, the new hot thing in space? So everything that's hot has a, da a dark side too. So that's my CIO cyber calling. So we talked about mining already. We're all well aware of tourism. 
Um, the internet is in space and being in the internet and space is being used in so many different ways uh, for the benefit of humanity. There's in orbit servicing. Did you know we can catch a satellite? This is non-classified information. NASA's had to catch satellites uh, to service them. Well, now lots of businesses are uh, contemplating and are successful in doing in-orbit servicing to our satellites. There's now been uh, already been in-orbit manufacturing. And for the benefit down here on Earth, uh, I think it's called C-Band. And the, that is being manufactured on International Space Station and then will be returned to lay those lines here for greater data transmission across the globe. So then there's um, the study of Earth with more and different sensors of Earth in places that are maybe not as covered by satellite coverage. So we're seeing advances in the ability to predict weather better weather model prediction. We get our weather every day from space and space weather is becoming a pretty hot item. So we're getting better at, at understanding space weather, slightly different than it is on earth, uh, solar storms and, and things like that. And the impact that those storms will have on our communications systems across the planet. And then GPS, we're seeing the future of GPS being more secure in that because you know so much business relies on on GPS here. I, I seldom go anywhere without using yeah. GPS, mostly for traffic. I pretty much know how to get around DC, but boy, where the traffic is is always a changeable item. And that, and so the business of space is growing, and the entrance of new countries are coming in as well. You're seeing so many African nations. Uh, begin to put satellites up into space. You're seeing the Middle East with more and more countries there adding to the space assets, uh, orbiting the planet and India. India's uh, space agency is definitely in growth mode and that, and of course, China and Russia, their programs are in growth mode as well. So it's very exciting and there's tons of business opportunities for space. It's hard to make a profit because it's still while it's cheaper, it's still expensive to get there. And there is a backlog of space launches. We only have a handful of space launch capabilities around the globe, and there's a backlog of launches to those. You don't just launch on schedule like our airplanes, right? Oh, I'm going to go down to the airport and get on my flight that takes off here. You can run into issues with weather and things like that that will disrupt some launches. So you know, the numbers are limited. It's a limited resource and that, so there's a lot of booking out into the future. I think I'm aware of one company that is already booked for 26 and they're negotiating their 2027 launches right now. And really they're booking space and then they'll figure out how to use it, space on the rocket, not space up in space. And that, so space is, the economy is alive and well. And what we're seeing are newcomers, uh, new countries, newcomers, new opportunities, um, and hopefully everybody has ethics in mind. And I want to end on, I hope they have cybersecurity in mind because yes. I got started. I, I was handed the opportunity to help lead the effort to overhaul NASA's cybersecurity posture. I had, a, I had an amazing team at NASA and it was with them and the cooperation of most at NASA that we were able to really start making some headway on our cybersecurity posture, including that posture in space. I don't want to see anything disrupted. You don't put five years of your life into something to have somebody in some business pierce that cybersecurity layer and, and make something silly happen that, that's on that. So I do hope people have a, an eye on cybersecurity protections while they pursue space. So well, those are just great, some of the things coming. Mm -hmm. That's a great overview. Um, and a couple of things come to mind. One, at, at last year's Uticon, we had a space panel. Uh, we had um, Sita Sony, who's the CEO of Space Tango, mm -hmm. And she's doing um, pharma in space and biological research in space on the International Space Station. And I think that's a fascinating um, capability. It could help all of humanity one day. And then uh, Space, um, uh, space Compass is a Japanese firm, which is a, a brand new firm, but it's two firms built a, uh, a joint venture together. 
um, NTT, which is their version of AT&T, um, and JSAT, which is the largest satellite provider in Asia. And what they're doing is geosynchronous satellites that are extremely high bandwidth and extremely high throughput uh, from geosynchronous. Now it's a little further, so it takes you an extra 100 milliseconds, but massive quantities of data. Um, and then another we work with is a uh, Turian space, which I'm very excited about because Turian hits upon uh, two of the missions that you mentioned. Uh, one is uh, they're doing, uh, they plan to do orbit maintenance. Uh, so you can grab a satellite, move it to a better orbit or grab space debris and throw it down to earth. Their first mission is space situational awareness. So they will take pictures of other satellites. And from uh, concept to launch was just a couple years. It's because they were able to rely upon so much other engineering and infrastructure, um, including uh, the Falcon 9 launch, you know, just a ride share to space. So this is just extremely hot. And in each of these cases, I know for a fact, they are paying attention to cybersecurity. So I think people are starting to get the message. Yay, I like to hear that. You know, as you laid out all the exciting things that are happening and, and we talk about the future of space, we also have to remember that these capabilities have a dark side. If I can catch, if I'm NASA, I'm going to just roll back here a few years, and I've created the ability to catch and release, catch and repair a, a satellite or, you know, fix it or whatever I need to do with it. That means somebody, um, a nefarious actor can do that too. All right, these are non-classified things that you and I are talking about. The more that we put in space, the more debris that we had. So space situational awareness has to get more granular. You know, we currently easily track space debris the size of a softball and larger. There, um, I believe it was DARPA that put out calls for experimentation and papers and studies and inventions associated with tracking space debris smaller than a softball. And, and that matters because a piece of debris created a pinhole, I think it was pinhole, uh, yeah, pinhole size uh, on the arm of the International Space Station. Well, they had to go out and inspect the inner, the arm of the International Space Station to make sure it was still uh, intact and usable as intended. Like it wasn't a safety problem that then when the when they were using the arm that it wouldn't break off or wouldn't do something unexpected. And then we'd have a whole series of problems on International Space Station. And that debris harms other satellites that may not be able to maneuver. Space Station itself um, has a lot of maneuvers to avoid big space debris fields. I like to call it the polygon of safety, right? They've got this polygon of safety to keep our astronauts and cosmonauts safe inside the station from that debris. And so they'll maneuver to keep them safe. And that, so you've got space debris and that. So every capability that we are advancing, it has a dark side and hopefully folks are thinking about that. And Another opportunity in space is how about let's catch some of that debris and manufacture it into something else. NASA did, and I um, wasn't me that thought of this. I just get to hang out with some really cool people. NASA did a challenge years ago on how to turn trash into something useful, a tool. And so then you think about it. Well, what if we could catch some of this debris and keep stay in space and manufacture something that we might need or remanufacture the start of a new satellite with ever, without ever having to leave space. So every everything we do has a dark side. Everything we do has, in space has this iteration as long as somebody has the imagination. Yeah, this is all fascinating. And you've got me thinking of so many things now. Um, you know, I, uh, I got to see a startup showcase at the big satellite conference a few months ago uh, where a bunch of startups were pitching their ideas to venture capitalists. And one of them had a great capability. Uh, now, you would need to put this on every satellite you launch, but it's kind of an adapter that would let anything plug into the satellite and um, recharge, refuel, uh, fix, uh, load new software, um, or grab it and move it to another place. Uh, so it's just amazing watching all of this stuff. Isn't it? It's so cool. And and I think we'll go back to kind of your discussion about watching the lunar lander. 
When we as humans look up and imagine, we partner so well. And I hope that in our pursuit of space exploration and science and technology and art and design and engineering and mathematics, that when we look up and the next time we look down and we look across our communities, that we think of it as a way to connect and build stronger connections here on, here on Earth so that maybe Earth can just be a little bit more peaceful for everyone. Well, see, Renee, that's why you're such a great leader. And it makes me get back to the beginning of our conversation. Thank God for liberal arts and the people who learn to communicate and read and write and think and inspire. So with that, thanks, Renee. I really appreciate this time. Oh, my pleasure, Bob. And I wish you and all your listeners the absolute best in the years to come. Oh, well, thanks, Renee. Thanks for listening to this OODA Loop production. For the latest analysis on cybersecurity, technology, and global risks, please visit www.oodaloop.com.